Okay, what we want to study is the history between 9-11 and the Midnight Cry. And the Sunday Law. And we've uh, come to understand that based upon Ezra 7 9, we have 120 prophetic days there. Then we understood that we had 70 prophetic days there. Now we're understanding that we have three months in this history and that all of these represent symbols of histories that go into here. We're also understanding now that from here to here, um, that you have 40 days to here, but from here to here, you have 10 days, bringing you to 50. Once you have the 40 days there, then you have the 40 years of the wilderness wandering. You have the 40 days of Christ fasting. Uh, you have the 40 days of Moses, 40 years old. The 40 years of Moses when he's 80 years old. The 40 days of Isaac waiting for his wife. Um, but we have, as a guy or as an emphasis to this history, we have Ezekiel 12. 23, is it, or 25? Yes. 23? Anyway, that this is where the effect of every vision takes place. So what's happening to us is because we understand, unlike most of the people that profess to be in this movement, that from 9-11, which is the tearing time, has been typified by the tearing time in the Millerite history, until the midnight cry in our history, this is where fanaticisms and heresies take place. That's where it took place in the Millerite history. It didn't take place before uh, the tearing time, and it didn't take place after the midnight cry in the Millerite history. Therefore, it's in this block of time where we are currently living that you have the fanaticisms and heresies come in. So in the very time that this message is under attack by people that profess to be involved with this message, the Lion of the tribe of Judah ha is now opening these truths up and it's hard to keep, keep abreast of them. They're coming so fast. And as he opens up truth, the separation process is accomplished in proportion to the light. As he opens up new light, whether we understand it or not, those people that are, are rejecting the light are being separated further. And as they get separated further, they become more under the influence of the strong delusion because right here we know is the falling away where the strong delusion comes. So as this argument escalates, as the line of the tribe of Judah opens these truths up, the class that is opposing this message are becoming more and more under the influence of darkness. So in order to put this in place and, and put this classroom presentations on the internet, we have to do a little, logic tells us we have to do a little bit of introductory work. That's what I intend to do before we get to the 120, Ezra 7, 9, the 70, the three months, uh, we understand now that this is the time of the, f the first fruits and that Christ illustrates all things and as the first fruit offering in Pentecost when he began his work in the sanctuary in heaven after the time period of Christ, uh, the cross, that he, Christ, was the first fruit of those that slept, <laughs> but he brought with him a group of first fruits. So the first fruit offering consists of two parts 
and we understand there was a first fruit offering to be made in the fall feast, and therefore we're understanding that this is the first development of the first fruits. This is the second, so we have that line going on here. We have Ezra 7, 9. We have the midnight cry. If you caught it in the sermon yesterday, um, I'll just run it by you. It, I don't know that Daniel was trying to nail this down, but it was there to see. Um, he pointed out this is where the foundational work always takes place, and he went to two, two quotes in his sermon, one where he pointed out that the rock, uh, of, which represents Christ, was the foundation for the time period of Christ. And we know that because we know the foundational work here is represented by these charts. Sister White says these truths are represented by the rock of ages. So the foundation in every history is Christ, but Daniel also went to a passage I think in councils to writers and editors, where, speaking of Paul, maybe it was Acts of the Apostles, he says, Paul presented prophecy as the foundation of his faith. Okay, so Christ is the foundation, but prophecy is the foundation. And what Peter illustrates in the history of Christ in this history is that even though everyone was saying that Christ was... Elijah or Jeremiah or some prophet, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter was led to say that Christ was the Messiah, or that Jesus was the Christ. All right, the Christ being the Greek word for Messiah. So what Peter's giving an illustration of is the, that he recognized him through prophecy. He was a fulfillment. The Messiah was a fulfillment of prophecy. But he's also emphasizing there that there's, there's false prophets, right? And true prophets. So he's emphasizing the true prophetic recognition. And the true prophetic recognition that Peter was setting forth here, right, in the history of Christ, which Sister White and Daniel put it in his sermon, also says that Nicodemus was confronted with this same realization. Nicodemus, Christ confronted Nicodemus with the truth that as there was a serpent lifted up in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. What Jesus was teaching Nicodemus was the same thing that Peter recognized, and that is that prophecy is a figurative delineation of events. Peter was acknowledging that Jesus, the man this, the, that he had been interacting with, was Christ, and Christ is a symbol. You know, he was recognizing him at the prophetic, prophetic level of prophetic symbolism, and this is what Jesus tried to teach, how Jesus tried to teach Nicodemus. He was saying, he was saying to Nicodemus, I am the serpent that was lifted up. You can only understand who I am if you're going to understand that I'm a fulfillment of prophecy, and you're only going to correctly understand that prophecy if you understand that prophecy is a figurative delineation of events. So when you go into this history in the synagogue of Capernaum, in that story of the crisis of Galilee, that is the very thing that is identified about why the disciples left Christ, is because they determined they were going to apply the figures literally. So as we go down this, this road of time, we're going to find that this issue over literal and figurative is the primary thing of the, the argument. The, the disciples that left him. They, they said, oh, how can we eat this man's flesh and drink his blood? She's real specific about that. It's not anything that we're deriving from our human understanding. She says it. They chose to accept his words in a literal fashion. That's what happens in here. Though they understood them spiritually. She says that they, they yeah, but so anyway, as we go through these histories, what we're looking at is that the 120 is figurative, the 70 is figurative, the three months are figurative, and you know that the people that started fighting back here before these things came to light, they're not getting these things. They're not, they're not watching them. Uh, they're only looking, if they're watching anything on the internet or anything, they're looking for what they can use against us. They're not understanding these things because they've chosen. If there's a, if there's a common denominator, there's one common denominator that's, that's bringing all these men together, and it's to oppose 
future for America. But if there's a secondary common denominator that virtually all of them are using is applying things literally when they need to. They don't all do it consistently. But I, I'm trying to think here which ones of them don't. Maybe there's one that I can think of that doesn't. Anyway, Magdala these. Then as a tower, do you have a problem with that? What? In Magdala yesterday in the sermon, he said it represented a tower. No, but if you listen carefully, he, he said that it represented um, no, pride. Okay, and that's what it is in the, in the scriptures. The, the false towers, the false churches, their strength are, is their human, their human strength. Yeah, but he's you know, lost, it's lost ten of four that means a fire. Yeah, I mean, we're not dealing with, we're not gutting his sermon here. We're just talking about this. So anyway, um, let's start with with these things, and we can move through them very quickly, because they're all review to most of us. Uh, but let's make sure that we understand the significance of these things. Uh, these, these men now are opposing what they call the patterns, while at the same time saying they don't oppose the patterns. Um, and we just need to make sure that we understand what these reform lines represent. So, on page one, can everyone, can you, pi you pick up everyone reading? If they speak really loud. Okay, I have to speak loud. loud and clear. Um, I'll take the first paragraph and then you, Michael. The mighty angel who instructed John was no less a personage than Jesus Christ, setting his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon dry land, shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. This position denotes his supreme power and authority over the whole earth. The controversy had waxed stronger and more determined from age to age, and will continue to do so to the concluding scenes when the masterly working of the powers of darkness shall reach their height. There goes Brother Jim. Satan united with evil men will deceive the whole world and the churches who receive not the love of the truth. But the mighty angel demands attention. He cries with a loud voice. He is to show the power and authority of his voice to those who have united with Satan to oppose the truth. This angel here, what angel is this that she's commenting on here? It's an angel of Revelation 10, right? When did he come down? August 11th, 1840, when Islam was restrained. Okay, but what's he typify? The angel of Revelation 18 that comes down when Islam is restrained. Okay, so she's dealing with both of these. And she says that he, it's showing what part he plays in the closing scenes of Earth's history. And he demands attention. Okay, Brother Michael. After these seven thunders uttered their voices, the injunction comes to John as to Daniel in regard to the little book. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. These relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. John sees the little book unsealed. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place in the first, second, and third angel's messages to be given to the world. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. Do you, do you know what the argument against this particular passage in Spirit of Prophecy is? Um, I, there may be several, but the reason I bring it in is I remember when I first was confronted with this argument, and it was when I worked at Hope International. And the guy that confronted me was a doctor that worked there, and he never did really settle into prophetic application. He was basically just a, a doctrinal guy, and he struggled with prophetic concepts. But what he's saying here, um, that... His argument here in this, this passage is where it says, these relate to future events which will be disclosed in their order. He's saying that this agrees with the fourth paragraph that we're not quite yet there at, where it says, the special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. So he's saying that these are two complementary passages and that he places this back in the time of John, when John's receiving the revelation, 
And John's told to seal up these things because they relate to future events that will be disclosed in their order in the Millerite history. And that it, that agrees with the delineation of events that would transpire under the first and second angels' messages. So you, you it, goes no it goes no further. It's an argument against applying this at the end of the world and as a, an illustration of the hi repetition of yes, Millerite history. Sure. Yeah, but it's what he's trying to, he's trying to deny, he was trying to deny without knowing it, the very, the very truth that is sealed up. And what's the truth that's sealed up? The, the repetition of history. Okay, so I, I, I'm putting this in the record here for the point, I want you to understand that this passage of the seven thunders, it was recognized in this message, in this movement, in the early 1990s. This isn't something that came into the, the message after 9-11. The line of the tribe of Judah opened this up at least by 1995. This, this argument that you just said, um, I've heard this recently, and I must have been a Facebook conversation or something from present truth people who are saying exactly what that guy said. They say, no, when you read this, it has to, she's talking about future from his time, not from her time. That's the argument. And these people are using this to oppose the idea that history repeats the way that we apply it. And they're in this message. They're in this message. Yeah. Well, they were in this message. Yeah, and they're arguing that they're not tearing down what they want built up at the same time. That We got an email this morning <coughs> saying that when these guys are saying that we're tearing down what we once built up, that's a lie. Well... If that's one of the arguments, this is proof of this. But how how do you how do you rectify this false teaching that you're hearing that I heard so many years ago? The she, seven thunders. She's not yeah. quoting. She's not quoting anything. She's saying these relate in a future tense from her day. There's n there's no way to really get around that. Yes, that's 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 one thing. And the other one is is that. The other one is, is Revelation 22, 10, and 11. There's only one thing that is not unsealed in the book of Revelation. It's the seven thunders. And in Revelation 22, it teaches they don't get unsealed until just before the close of human probation. And the Millerite history is well before the close of human probation. Millerite history takes place in the history of Daniel 11, verse 40. So anyway, we got that, in, that thought in place. Next paragraph. The books of Daniel and Revelation are one. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. One a book sealed, the other a book opened. John heard the mysteries which the thunders uttered, but he was commanded not to write them. Sister Brittany. The special light given to John which was expressed in the seven thunders was a delineation of events which would transpire under the first and second angel's messages. Okay, so what, what I'm saying is <coughs> that based upon that second paragraph, Sister White is clear that the unsealing of the seven thunders has been typified by the unsealing of the book of Daniel and the Millerite history. And what was unsealed in the book of Daniel was unsealed in 1798 for the Millerites. And the message that was unsealed to them is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 with all the surrounding truths. But what was the... And I, and I know there's a lot, of way, a lot of right answers to this, but what was the essential thing that was unsealed in 1798? Day for a year is probably the correct answer. If you don't have that, you can't figure it out. But 2300 the 2300 days. What, do, what does Miller say? All the, he understood the, the commencement, the commencement yeah. points of what? Yeah, the, he, he understood 677 as the beginning of the 2520, 457 as the beginning of the 2300 days, and 508. So what was unsealed to Miller <coughs> were the time prophecies. It had to, the year-day principle would have to be unsealed to him in order to make sense of it. But he was given by the angel Gabriel the commencement points of these th three time prophecies that from that point on, he's, 
used to put together, as Duane pointed out, virtually every truth on the 1843 chart is the work of William Miller. Even when you get to the role of Islam that, we, that Sister White points to Josiah Litch, Josiah Litch is just a Millerite preacher that was preaching what they were all preaching, including Miller, and he was used to fine tune that, but Miller had been preaching this before Josiah Litch. So there's something that is unsealed at the end of the world that will have the same impact or dynamics in this reform movement as that that took place in the Millerite movement. We've already said it, but for the record, what is it? Repetition. Repetition of history, of the Millerite history in our history. Okay, so, so be, because of that, we're at the point now where we're, ha we're, we're having to stop and take a breath and say, okay, we need to go through this, the history that we're in because it's becoming so full of light that we need to, to isolate piece by piece to put things in order. How is that happening? Based upon the four paragraphs we've read. Who unsealed it? Lion the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he puts his foot upon the land and the sea, what is that symbolizing? Worldwide. A worldwide message, he says one place, but in the first paragraph, what does it symbolize? Uh, Supreme power and authority. Shows the part which he is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy. In this passage, what part is he acting? Christ, the angel. He's the unsealer. He's the unsealer. So if you're going to take a position against the light that is being unsealed, are you taking a position against human beings? Or others. You're taking a position against Christ. He's the one that takes credit for unsealing the truth of the patterns, as they call them. Um, okay, mm -hmm. Sister Tamina, what? The pattern man. Yeah, he's the pattern man in two senses. He's the pattern man in terms of our uh, experience of victorious, sanctified living, <coughs> but he's the pattern man in the sense that he's the one that unseals the prophetic patterns. Read that. You gotta read really loud. Loud. No German accent. Okay, Sister Bronwyn, I guess. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to this time. And like the third angel's message, it has been fulfilled and will continue to be present through till the close of time. So, this is two witnesses that the Millerite history is repeated in our history. In the first passage, it says the seven thunders represent a delineation of events that would transpire into the first and second angel's message, and it also represented future events that will be disclosed in their order. So when we consider the seven thunders, what is it emphasizing? Events. Events. Events in their order, but events. When we consider the parable of the ten virgins, which is the identical truth, what is it emphasizing? Uh, no way. We take or one off. The experience. This is the, the, the parable of the ten virgins illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. These two lines are brought together. One is emphasizing the events, the other experience, and the events are going to be in agreement. I'm, I'm not denying that the way marks of the parable of the ten virgins are essential, must be guarded and all that. But the parable of the ten virgins, I mean, that's, that's what people are being stung by in this message now. As we apply this, we're saying in this history, there's a class of foolish virgins and wise virgins, and the foolish virgins are going the wrong direction, and they're saying, oh, you're picking on me, you're calling me a foolish virgin. 
Uh, now we're just laying out the prophetic lines and when it comes to laying out the prophetic line from the aspect of the parable of the ten virgins, it's emphasizing that one class has oil and the other doesn't. Right? Okay, so third witness, Brother Jason, loud and clear. God has given the messages of Revelation 14 their place in the line of prophecy. And their work is not to cease till the close of this earth's history. The first and second angels' messages are still true for this time and are to run parallel with this which follows. The third angel proclaims his warning with a loud voice. After these things, said John, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. In this illumination, the light of all three messages is combined. Okay. The, the history of the first, second, third angel's message is the history of the seven thunders, and it's the history where the parable of the ten virgins was fulfilled to the very letter. Read the next quote, Brother Paul. I have had precious opportunities to obtain an experience. I have had an experience in the first, second, and third angel's message. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven. Men and women, enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three, angel, three messages in their order. Five sketches, four and nine. The next one, Brother Brian. John saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. That work is the voice of the people of God, proclaiming the message of warning to the world. So, when it comes to the seven thunders, what is being emphasized is the events, the way marks of the history. When it comes to the parable of the ten virgins, which is teaching the same principle that the Millerite history is repeated in our history, it's emphasizing the experience of God's people, but when it comes to the angels of Revelation 14 and 18, what are the angels emphasizing? The, workers. the work that gets accomplished during that history. Same truth, but different emphasis. Another thing connected with the angels, Brother Tyler? Connected? Yeah. The first and second messages were given in 1843 and 1844. We are now under the proclamation of but all three of the messages are still to be proclaimed. Three cannot, there cannot be a third without a first and a second. These messages we are, give, are to give to the world in publications and discourses showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. So this, the events were the, the unsealing, the events of the seven thunders, Revelation 10. Matthew 25, parable of the ten virgins, is the experience. Revelation 14, three angels' messages, represents the work that God's people are to do. And we're to take Revelation 14 that was fulfilled in the Millerite history and do what? What was the last thing that he read? Showing in the line of prophetic history the things that have been and the things that will be. All of these all of these are emphasizing the truth of the seven thunders that was sealed up in Revelation 10 and unsealed just before human probation closes in Revelation 22. But even though this principle is represented in these three ways, the primary emphasis of, the emphasis of these three lines is different. They have to be blended together to put all everything in order. We'll take one, one other illustration of this. What do you mean by blending them together? You lay out the events and they're over the top of it. You put in where the experience comes in and then the work that will be doing during those events. Yeah. You know, what is the events of Millerite history? The way marks. The way marks, but what are they? Time of the end. Time of the end. Darkness. Time of the end. 
first angel's message empowered. Tarian time. Midnight cry. Door closes. Okay, there's more, but uh, you know there's going to be seven primary ones because this is the seven events that's represented by the seven thunders. But what is the main thing that in, in Revelation 10 that Christ is emphasizing of these weight marks? The angel coming down. This here? Is that what it is? He comes down in Revelation 10 and this is where he seals up the seven thunders. But what did we say? Eating the little book, is that what is emphasized there? We read it already. Oh, the way he stands. He stands right here. The thing, the, it's, it's the part that he plays. What's the part that he plays? The unsealing. The unsealing. He's, he's emphasizing right here. All the way through, he's, he's unsealing stuff. But he's the one that brings the light. Okay, so now, once you see the, uh, the events, then you lay over the experience, right over the top. Here is, this is the midnight cry of the parable of the ten virgins. This is the door closing. Uh, this is the tearing time in the Millerite history. And it's from here, what do we derive from here? When we go into Millerite history and we, realize, and we look at what was recorded about the tearing time, what happened at the tearing time? The experience, how? How so? The yeah, this is where the Protestants turn against them. They start getting all the, the fanaticism comes in, the rebukes about Miller and the message, and they lose their zeal right here, right? This is about their experience. And, and, and it's about their experience leading up to the midnight cry and what happens when they finally have a day specified, you know, their experience of carrying it once you have that in place on this line, then what's this? When's the first angel come into history? Right here, he arrives. Is there a work that has to be done? What's the work? Yeah, you have to start coming to grips with the increase of knowledge. Then it's empowered. Is there a work when the first angel's message is empowered? Yeah, but what's the work? What do you got to do when that angel comes down? You got to eat the little book and all the everything else we're answering. Uh, tearing time when the second angel comes down. What do you got to do? You got to eat that little book. He has a writing in his hand. Uh, what do you got to do here at the midnight cry? You can take the message. What do you got to do here? So, so that's the work of God's people in these different histories. But one other line about this truth about Millerite history, repeating, we all know this one. Whose turn is it? Mine? Did you read? Yep. The work in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past, and the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our time. So I'm going to put the reform movements, movements But we get the events from Revelation 10, the seven thunders. We get the experience from the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, and we get the work from the angel of Revelation 14 and 18. Where do we get the reform movement emphasis from? From Isaiah Line upon line? On the Alpha and Omega. Yeah, those are all supporting. I'm, I, I'm just going to take a wild guess and say that this this principle laid out in the spirit of prophecy. But I'll, oh, you're right, it's Isaiah 28 and it's Christ's work illustrating the end from the beginning. But I, I'm saying that the truth that Millerite history repeats in our day and age is also derived from the writings of Ellen White. And here we're looking at one of them. She, she has that quote where she says that all of the experiences of the pioneer, or sorry, the, the patriarchs and prophets and everything in the Old Testament and New Testament is repeating. 
No, I don't know. So for every, Does she have that quote? Yeah, she says that all, all everything that's happened in the Old Testament is happening now. In the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. And in former ages. It's all coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the, it's the one where she says, where she quotes 1 Corinthians 13, and that, but at the end of the paragraph, she says, Each of the ancient prophets spoke more for our days and the days in which, we, which they lived. Then she quotes 1 Corinthians 10, 11, and then she says, The Bible has accumulated and bound up its treasures for this last generation, all the events and transactions of the. Of yeah. The, Old Testament are repeating in the church in these last days yeah. or something. That's a paraphrase, but that's what she says. Um, take the next quote. But Satan was not idle. He now attempted what he has attempted in every other reformatory movement to deceive and destroy the people by, uh, by palming off upon them a counterfeit in place of the true work. As there were false Christs in the first century of the first of the Christian church, so there arose false prophets in the 16th century. What is she doing there? Not lots, but what is she doing there? That, or go ahead. Well, Loud and clear. She's telling us that as, as the Lord works and unseals, Satan is also, what you say, he's breathing an unholy influence on those that would hear his message to, to counter work. That the okay, but she's... she's She's being specific about reform movements. Or we, where we take the quote for 343, yeah. she's adding that, that it's very detailed what these reform movements are about. And the devil, is a, he's a student of Bible prophecy, and he knows when these reform movements are going to come, and he, he, he prepared the work to, so that it, his work is in place when they arrive. Okay, so what... Yes, it, and it's emphasizing for those that are foolish enough to think that these patterns are identifying a peaceful, tranquil experience for the faithful virgins as they go through this history, and that there's not going to be a shaking in here. She's saying, no, there's going to be a shaking. There's always false prophets. But what is she, what is she placing into this scenario that we have been studying here recently in Sabbath school? She's bringing some German into it, isn't she? No. Oh, it's the six, 16th century. Oh, uh, Luther. Luther. She's, she's, she's making sure we understand that Luther's reform movement is in here too, right? He was given the first angel's He was given the last Okay. She was a prophet. Every reform movement uh, possesses the same characteristics. That's what she's saying. God's dealing with men are, is ever the same. to recognize in our history today how the counterfeit came in before. The counterfeit what? Well, the, she's saying here that it's a counterfeit in place of the truth, so a counterfeit reform line. How did that come in before in our history, what we're dealing with? Because it seems like we've laid out the true and then they've started fighting. It's not like they I, I don't know that you, have to do, that you have to find a counterfeit reform movement from that quote. She, she's saying in, the in work. Place of, in, place of uh, in place of what? The true what? The true reform. No, the true work is what she said. Okay, but if we're labeling these lines as different things, one of them is... Okay, let me give you an example. I, I don't believe that it's going to be a singular thing. I think he's going to counterfeit lots of things. On 9-11 in this reform line, what do you got to do? You got to eat the little book. What does that mean? Well, you've got two options in this movement now. It means the glad reception and comprehension of the message, and that's it. Or it means that you got a message you got to carry to the Adventist church. Okay, who is emphasizing which first? The idea that all it meant was the glad reception and the comprehension of the message came first. It wasn't until after that that the Lord took it deeper to where it means, no, this is a message that gets carried to the Adventist church. The, the counterfeit preceded the true. That's the work of this angel, the angels represent the work. I, I, the I, go, go ahead. In our history, the counterfeit reform is, I mean, if we want to say that there's a counterfeit reform, it's the work of false education. It's the mystery of iniquity. It's what we essentially are battling. 
because these men who take up this are picking up the same arguments of the hypocrites of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and they're making their arguments based upon the true false education, and they're fighting against true education. So That's I agree with that. But they didn't. They weren't doing well, that until after this message came, started coming in more power. Then they started fighting it. It's not like they were using that before. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the fighting though that was concerned. Oh, it's with, it's the, the work of false education. It's the actual so, principles of the education yeah. that came. And they were first. way before okay, yes, this came out. Okay, so as long as you're clear, I agree with him. He's. I thought I heard you saying, and, and I and if you're saying what I'm going to say that you were saying then I don't think that it demands this. This being the structure of a reform movement, I don't think we have to have a structure of a counterfeit reform movement before. Okay. It's, it's the, the testing truths are going to be counterfeited, the work, um, the experience. You're seeing people now that are basing their experience upon emotion instead of a thus saith the Lord. Uh, there's counterfeit experience going on. No, we do see that there is a counterfeit three angels' messages that are, will be coming in, and a great work in the city, and this great work has already been... I mean, it's That's been a work. On. Yeah. Angels' yeah. work. It's been, it's been going on. Got counterfeit Five. events. Yep. When they're saying that the Sunday law, or, or that 9-11 is the day of the Lord, that's a counterfeit event. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a moving the way marks. Uh, counterfeit experience, an experience that's based upon emotion instead of the Word of God. And it's definitely, a, it's a counterfeit reform movement because nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of this movement. Because the, 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 the fact that they're in the reform movement, they start in 9-11, they come out of that darkness, but then they're the disobedient prophet, they return to it, and then they're still, they still claim to be given this reform movement, but they're given a false one. So it, in essence, it is a false one going side by side. But you say it comes back just because they turn back. It came first because they turned back to what They go well, back to their vomit. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, yeah. But what we have to recognize, what we can recognize now, if this is our history, and we put this as 1989 to 9-11, to the midnight cry to the Sunday law, door closing, and then till Michael stands up, that there's, there's a specific work that goes on here, a specific work that goes on here, a specific work that goes on here, and a specific work that goes on here, and there's going to be counterfeits and false prophets in each of these histories but it's a, different, it's a different shaking. Each of these periods of time have their own attributes. Go ahead. So, now it, in Revelation 18, it's supposedly, it's, it's 9 11, it says that work is the voice of the people of God proclaiming a message of warning to the world. Yep. And your point is? What is that supposed to mean? But it's, there's two parts to it there. No, that's what it is. Well, there's a message. Evangelize, you know, that's no, yeah, that's the that's the counterfeit. Right? The message of Revelation 18 is the message of the judgment of the living, and judgment begins with Adventism. And the message goes from here to Adventism around the world. That Adventism is now being judged. The counterfeit to that is, we don't need to worry about that. Let's take the gospel to the eleventh hour workers. The quote that says two distinct calls breaks down Revelation 18. And it says the first call is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's 9-11. And the second one is come out of our my people at the Sunday law. Yep. It's two distinct calls, two temple cleansings. Two distinct calls are made to the temple. Just t type in that, two distinct calls. <laughs> and it talks about Christ. It says that at the beginning of his ministry, he cleansed the temple. Then at the end of the ministry, he cleansed, his temple, te cleansed the temple. So, in like manner, it says there are two distinct calls that the church has now explained them. So Okay, so this is all review, right? Okay, are you, are you following the logic here? Okay, so you could spend a great deal of time now really isolating certain parts of this and you know, defining why these are waymarks. What's a waymark? In, in the dictionary of Ellen White's day and age, when she uses the word waymark, it's a mark along the way. Um, 
How did the pioneers understand what a waymark was? How, what was their definition of a waymark? If you want to find out, go into the, L to, to the Pioneer CD-ROM, look up Joseph Bates as the author, and look at the books that he wrote, and there's one that is called High Heaps and Waymarks. It's got one of the longest titles for a book you'll ever see, and he's going to define the waymarks as the events that took place in the Millerite history. Okay, and that's what, so all I'm saying is that's exactly how we define the waymarks. Yeah, we read through them, they, they're in order the same way. I mean, it's like looking into the phone line. So why is he called why does Joseph Bates call the waymarks high heaps? Sister high Tamina. Heaps. What is high heaps? Exodus. It's from Exodus. They, had, they were to set up high later. heaps along the way. What's a high heap? It's a pile of rocks. A pile of rocks. Okay, why were they to set up piles of rocks? So that when their children said, What's this pile of rocks? they could say, Oh, this is the Red Sea. Okay, it's to remember the past. They all did. And that's how the pioneers understood it. That's how we're supposed to understand the definition of a waymark. So, uh, what's another definition of a waymark? You know, we put a bid in on this property a couple months ago, but one of the things that you were going to have to pay for what was what? An, uh, if a you survey. would, a survey. Oh, to mark out the land. To mark it on all four points. So, what's another definition of a waymark? It's a landmark. And what's the Bible say is, uh, I don't know if it says wicked, but what's, yeah, you don't move your neighbor's landmark, right? Okay, it's, it's wicked to do that. So when you're, these are waymarks, they're landmarks, and the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy says they're not to be moved. It's wrong to move a landmark. It's wrong to say the day of the Lord is 9-11. From the very beginning. So it'd be like them go disassembling yeah. those um, piles of rocks. Yeah, and moving them. Taking them somewhere else. Put them somewhere else. Oh, no, this is where we crossed. Yeah. It's what the Catholic Church is doing. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's what these waymarks are. That, and so which one of these is emphasizing the waymarks? Up here. The events. Revelation 10. The events. How many, how many primary events are, they in, are there in a reform movement? Seven. 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 Okay. Where do you come up with that? Seven. How can you prove that? Seven. But can you prove something with one witness? Okay, the seven kings. You ha you're going to have to have a second witness. Okay, so we're heading towards the seven kings to get a seven second witness to the seven thunders. Why, why can't you do churches? Leviticus 26. Seals. Or why can't you do the churches and seals? Because the, the, they don't have, they don't have, ha, ha, for instance, the kings have a name that parallels these events. The churches can't say that the church has a name. They, no. they have names that parallel the events. Yeah, yeah, but in a different way. But it doesn't matter if it's in a different way. If well, it parallels it, it parallels it. The churches happen at one place. There you go. There's the problem. Yeah, is it the seven churches, seven seals, and the seven thunders have a 4-3 combination that, that breaks them out of being just a straight number seven? Okay. They're not, they're not a in chronological. A linear. They're, not, yeah, they're not a sequence. Okay. The kings are a clear sequence, though. One this right guy came, that guy came, okay. and that guy came. Do you know what we're talking about, the kings? Okay, that's where we're going, is the kings. The last seven kings of Judah illustrate the seven thunders perfectly. And the last seven kings of Israel perfectly illustrate the reform movement that takes place in the 11th hour workers. Okay, but we're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. So uh, there's last a. Seven kings of Judah represent what did you say? The, the seven thunders. Seven thunders, and the last seven kings of Israel represent the eleventh hour workers. So after. Mike they represent represent the reform movement of the eleventh hour workers. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. That's okay. it's new, but it's it, it, and it wasn't until this last camp meeting. 
that there was a little, a little piece of information that come in that allowed us to put the last seven kings of Israel in their proper place. We could see it. You could see it. Um, just so you know what were the logic, go to, you'll be able to see this, but you won't be able to align it correctly without page five, without some added prophetic guidance. On the bottom of page five, the seventh king from the end of Israel, the northern kingdom, <laughs> is Jeroboam. And his name means the people will contend to toss. What's toss? What's another word for toss? I'd throw shaking. Okay. The people will contend prop properly to toss. That is grapple, mostly figuratively to wrangle. That is hold a controversy uh, by implication to defend. So Jeroboam II, he represents... We're gonna, we haven't proved this yet, but he represents the first of seven, but it's in reverse order. He's the seventh. There's going to be a sixth king, a fifth king, a fourth king, a third king, a second king, and a first king of ancient Israel, the northern kingdom. He represents the first in this, what's the word, declining escalation. And I'm saying that he's representing the reform movement of the 11th hour workers. Okay, whereas for, for some time we have shown that the last seven kings of Judah, the southern kingdom, beginning with Manasseh, represents the seven thunders. So what's the seven thunders? It's the history, it's a delineation of events that took place under the first and second angel's message and it relates to future events that will be disclosed in their order. And Manasseh down to Zedekiah is a second witness to these events. But, but I'll show you something without getting into it. This king, the seventh to the end king of the northern tribe of Israel means controversy. All right? I'm going to say that this is the controversy that takes place as the Sunday law is approaching. As the Sunday law is approaching, Sister White says, heretofore those that have predicted that religious intolerance in this country have been regarded as alarmist. But as the event so long doubted and disbelieved to seem to be approaching, an impetus comes into the work, the movement that heretofore could not have been recognized. All right, so as the United States begins making movements for the Sunday law, there's going to be a controversy. I'm saying that that's this king here. And this is what awakens the 11th hour workers. It begins to awaken them to the significance of Sabbath and Sunday. Because the faithful Adventists at this time here are going to start arguing you know, the, the, the separation of church and state publicly. So this is before the Sunday law to midnight. Uh, okay, so what does, what does Zechariah mean? God is remembered. God is remembered. Okay. Right. Ne what does uh, Shalem, the next king, mean? A requital, that is retribution, a fee, recompense, reward, to be safe, figuratively to be completed, by implication to be friendly, make amends, and finish. Okay, so the 11th hour workers are n ha get acquainted with the Sabbath here. They're going to remember the Sabbath here, and now they're making peace with the Lord right here. Isaiah 27.5. Isaiah 27, How do you see that Shalem represents, oh, to make amends, make peace, and I will make peace with you? And then Menahem is comforter. What's the comforter? Uh, this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the 11th hour workers. And then the next two kings, they have different names, but they're the same name. Pekaniah and Pekah, what's that mean? When something's doubled. This is the fourth angel's message, the perfect fulfillment. And it, it says, God has observed to open the senses, especially the eyes, to be observant. Right here in this history, this is where the eyes are fully opened of the 11th hour workers. Right? This is the living testimonies going on right in here with both of these, because it's, it's repeated. And the, the last king is Hosea. And what's it mean? Deliver. Deliver. This is the final 
deliverance. The, the overlap takes place um, at the midnight cry then? We're not worried about that. Yeah. All we're worried about right now is that whether you can put it in place or not, what we understand as Seventh-day Adventists about the experience of the eleventh hour workers, you can see it in these kings' names. How do you lay the, um, the angels' messages in their time on where, where do you put the numbers on that? Not worried about that. I just want you to see that you can, you can do that. I want to get to here at some point to make a second witness to the seven thunders. And the reason that I'm saying that, I'll tell you the logic. Once you see that the seven thunders has a second witness with the last seven kings of Judah, okay, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoiah has, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. Once you see this history is the history of the Millerites, and it's therefore our history, then there's all kinds of things tied together. All right, all kinds of things. Because you can see, you can see Manasseh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah in Leviticus 26. I mean, that's the four seven times. But you can also see that Manasseh in 677 begins the 2520 that comes to a conclusion in the Millerite history. So Manasseh carries with him the characteristics of these seven kings and the 2520 time prophecy takes you right in to the history of the Millerites where you have the seven thunders and Manasseh and the following six kings is teaching the same lesson at one level that the seven thunders in Millerite history is. It's identifying a progressive fall of the glorious land. Okay, so when the line of the tribe of Judah opens up the seven thunders as being the repetition of the Millerite history in our history, that's cool. But when he takes you to the last seven kings and shows that those seven kings are a second witness to the seven thunders, then it starts getting profound. But then when he, when he takes this history as the, the beginning history of the 2520, and Jesus always illustrates the end from the beginning, now he's taking the seven thunders into Leviticus 26 and the scattering and the gathering. And it's, it's at this level, this is where these guys get lost. This is where they quit following, is in this, in this reality, because th one of the things they're not paying attention to is the meaning of these kings. And the meanings of these kings, they start impacting not simply the seven thunders, but they impact Ezra 7, 9. The names of these kings correspond to the waymarks that are represented in Ezra 7, 9. So it's a, it's a development of truth, and who's doing it? Christ. Christ, that's the part that he's playing. And are you supposed to pay attention to it? Yeah. It says he demands attention. Habakkuk 2, stand upon your watch, and watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I'm reproved the argument. Okay, so this is, the, it's this, the brethren that are, the, the primary guys that are fighting this had opportunity to begin to recognize this at the Oklahoma Prophecy School. Because it was there that the prophetic chain was put in place. And, and we took several presentations and we divided them up saying, here, you do a couple, you do a couple, you do a couple, and I'll do a couple. We all did some of them. So they publicly were grappling with the prophetic chain. And the prophetic chain is connected with these last seven kings because Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah were all <coughs> put in subjection by Nebuchadnezzar and Jerusalem was destroyed. So Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah are a link in the chain. First, second, third angel's message, Nebuchadnezzar being the fourth in that history, they had opportunity to begin to grapple with these realities of the meanings of the names and the, the, that they're seven kings, their connection with the 2520, but it's at that point, 2007 or whenever it was, 2010, that, that they just began to close their eyes. All right.
So let's, let's go back to our note. Ichabod, page two. Did you read? You read? The sound of wailing and lamentation reached the watcher beside the tabernacle. The messenger was brought to him, and the man said unto Eli, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. Eli could endure all this terrible as it was, for he had expected it. But when the messenger added, and the ark of God is taken, a look of unutterable anguish passed over his countenance. The thought that his sin had thus dishonored God and caused him to withdraw his presence from Israel was more than he could bear. His strength was gone, he fell, and his neck brake, and he died. Next paragraph, Sister Brittany. John. I know. Good Sister life. Tamina. <laughs> Okay. I wanted to add a point in here, Jeff. I was just looking up there. When you were putting up the, the, the things this morning, you know, the, the figures, you got the three months there, well, 120 days, also four months. So that whole period from 9 11 to Sunday was seven months, symbolically. Well, in 1 Samuel 6 1, it says, And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. I wonder if that has any significance. Because you, you marked out. That'd probably be in this country, history. But you marked out on the candy that the Ark of the Lord returns at the Sunday lot, and as a fractal, I put it as the midnight track. So, yeah, uh, but let, I don't want to go there. I, g I get you. Okay. I want, I want us all, but especially Brian, to see this. Um, this is a link in the chain, okay? That begins with Noah and his three sons, okay? And there's a disappointment after the third that's always illustrated in these chains, okay? The disappointment for Noah and there's, uh, for, in, in, with Adam and Eve and Christ in the garden, the disappointment was is they're driven out of the garden, okay? And then you have the fourth being Abel, uh, with, with Sham, Japheth, and Ham, the disappointment is the flood, and you have Noah. But in this history, this chain just goes through history, it's a three-one combination. This history, you have Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli, and the disappointment is the ark is taken, right? And Ichabod is pronounced, and then Samuel is raised up. So there's two other places where Ichabod is marked. At this point, the ark is, was being kept where? Shiloh. At Shiloh, okay. And in Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah uses the history of Shiloh to illustrate his prediction that Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. You know, the Jeremiah 7 where he says, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Later on, about verse 14, he says, let's read it so you get my point. R Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah is given a warning that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, and in verse 12 it says, well, I'll start in verse 10. In verse 4 he's saying, you're trusting in, in the lying words, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these, and then in verse 10 he says, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. That's the sanctuary, right? in Jerusalem. In this house, which is called by my name, ha is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. When the sanctuary becomes a den of robbers, what happens? The, this is marking that the Lord is about to cleanse the temple. Okay. 
in the time of Jeremiah. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. So Jeremiah is saying, what took place with Hophni, Phinehas, and Eli, and the capturing of the ark in Shiloh, is illustrating what's about to happen to Jerusalem. What's going to happen to Jerusalem? Destroyed. It's going to be destroyed by who? By Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, so was Jerusalem destroyed any other time? By Rome. So in what's happening with, in here, what I'm going to try to show you, is that the destruction of Jerusalem is a symbol of the Sunday law. And the key to that is Ichabod. Notice what Sister White says under Nebuchadnezzar. Whose turn is it? Taminas? Um, I believe Brahman. Brahman? The church worships the image of the beast when Jesus marked, even as the inhabitants of Babylon worship the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar set up in the plain of Jordan. Now wait a second, just so we know. When Nebuchadnezzar set up the, the image on the plain of Dura, what are the waymarks? You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego coming to the Sunday law. And then Nebuchadnezzar is disappointed because he, see, he finds out his best men are refusing to bow down. So he throws them into the fire. And then what happens? A fourth appears. So you, you can show this link right there in the history she's referring to, the 3-1 combination. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar's disappointment, and then the fourth, Christ appears. Go ahead. The church of God was captured in Babylon, deeply tried, deeply humiliated. The glory had departed from Israel. The sons and daughters of Judah were captive, and the sacred vessels of the sanctuary had become the property of the spoiler. The beautiful temple was in ruins, and Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory is departed from Israel, was heard in songs of lamentation. When you see Ichabod, Jerusalem, or Shiloh is destroyed. And it's destroyed at this third way mark. All right. Read the next one. Loud and clear. The blind obstinacy, obstinacy of the Jewish leaders and the detestable crimes perpetrated within the besieged city excited the horror and indignation of the Romans. When Titus at last decided to take the temple by storm, he determined, however, that if possible, it should be saved from destruction. But his commands were disregarded. After he had retired to his tent at night, the Jews, sallying from the temple, attacked the soldiers without. In the struggle, a firebrand was flung by a soldier through an opening in the porch, and immediately the cedar-lined chambers about the holy house were in a blaze. Titus rushed, rushed to the place, followed by his generals and legionaries, and commanded the soldiers to quench the flames. His words were unheeded. In their fury, the soldiers hurled blazing brands in the chambers adjoining the temple. And then, with their swords, they slaughtered in great numbers those who had found shelter there. Blood flowed down the temple steps like water. Thousands upon thousands of Jews perished. Above the sound of battle, above the sound of battle, voices were heard shouting, Ichabod, the glory is departed. So when Jerusalem is destroyed, Ichabod is marked, and Ichabod is marked beginning with when Shiloh, did, is Shiloh ever going to be the place where the ark is kept and ever again? No. After that? No. Okay, the, the, that history is an illustration of the Sunday law. Notice the next quote, Brother Paul. Christ's words have been spoken in the hearing of a large number of people. But when he was alone, Peter, John, James, and Andrew came to him as he sat upon the Mount of Olives. Tell us, they said, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Jesus did not answer his disciples by taking up separately the destruction of Jerusalem and the great day of his coming. He mingled the description of these two events. Had he opened to his disciples future events as he beheld them, they would have been unable to endure the sight. In mercy to them, he blended the description of the two great crises, leaving the disciples to study out the meaning for themselves. When he referred to the destruction of Jerusalem, his prophetic words reached beyond that event to the final conflagration 
in that day when the Lord shall rise out of his place to punish the world for their iniquity, when the earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This entire course was given not for the disciples only, but for those who should live in the last scenes of this earth's history. So the destruction of Jerusalem is a destruction, an illustration of the seven last plagues. And when did the seven last plagues begin? When Michael stands up at the, at the conclusion of the Sunday Law Crisis. And what's the Sunday Law Crisis? It's the third angel's message. Okay. Can you have a third without a first and a second? So the destruction of Jerusalem at the end of the world comes at the conclusion of the third message. Michael stands up, then Jerusalem is destroyed, seven last plagues. But that's been typified by the destruction of Jerusalem by Titus and by Nebuchadnezzar and also in this history by Eli. And it's always the same history. It's the three-one combination, right? Okay, so if we take this now, because we want to focus in on these seven kings so we can get a second witness to these events. What three kings did Nebuchadnezzar deal with? King Chimzedekai. The fourth king in the scenario is Nebuchadnezzar. The first is Jehoiakim. Kim. Chin. And Zedekiah. All right. What's the disappointment in this history? The destruction of Jerusalem. But how does how does Zedekiah represent that disappointment? The eyes are put out. That's that's bad. But what's worse? He gets to watch all his children slaughtered before him, and then his eyes are put out. So the last thing he ever sees is his family slaughtered. I knew, I knew a, a guy, I still know him, and he's a little bit wacko. And Bronwyn grew up around him, and she would tell you he's a little bit wacko too. And some of his brothers are a little bit off. And, and the reason that they speculate that he's off is that because of their father. And what happened to their father, their for, he was from Poland. And in World War II, the, the, the Nazis came into his home and they brought his family out and they slaughtered his entire family and they put him in a concentration camp. The last thing he saw as a free man was his entire family get executed and then he went into a concentration camp and the stories they told about what went on in the concentration camp that their dad had told them were just unbelievable. But it made their, their dad, he was this he was a strange bird, but his children were too, okay? So Zedekiah, he says, he's a symbol of a disappointment here that, that uh, takes place with the destruction of Jerusalem, but these three kings are all confronted by Nebuchadnezzar. He deals with all three of them. This is the three-one combination. So what is this? What do they represent? Yeah, yeah keep going. The three angels' messages. This is the first angel's message. This is the second. This is the third. Okay, so you, <clears throat> you can't... This truth about Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah, the line of the tribe of Judah has locked it so firmly into prophetic history that you don't even have to deal with what their names mean. Okay? Dealing with what their names means opens up even more light. Yeah, it's, but just at this level, you can see that this, why? Because the destruction of Shiloh and Jerusalem is a symbol of the end of the world, and the end of the world is the three angels' message in the Sunday Law Crisis. And so th this history of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, it's, it's locked in, upheld by the prophetic word all over the place. So as you see these three kings... And then you back up to here, to Manasseh. 
What do you know about Manasseh? He's a kid. He's an earnest. Uh, you're, he, he, he's an earnest, but, but what you know about him is that he begins the 25-20. Okay, so Manasseh, you're going to have, he is the seventh. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. He's the seventh of these seven kings, which we are going to suggest is a second witness to the seven thunders, but he is also the symbol of the 2520 that reaches its conclusion when? In 1844. And in 1844, what do you, ha what do you have? The, this 2520 reaches its conclusion on October 22nd, 1844. That's a 10. But the, what is, what arrives here? Third the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you have a third without a first and a second? Mm -hmm. So in this history, you're going to have a first and a second. When was the first message empowered in the Millerite history? August 11th, 1840, when the mighty angel came down. But when did the first angel arrive in this history? 1798. So we will find in our next presentation that Manasseh represents the arrival of the first angel's message in this history and that Ammon, the next king, represents the part that Christ is playing in unsealing this. And Josiah, what does Josiah mean? Uh, uh, foundation. foundation. Okay, that represents William Miller. And then you have Jehoiahaz. What happens to Jehoiahaz? He's seized. He's seized and taken to Egypt. There is a restraint right here. And when he's seized, what does the king of Egypt do? He replaces him with Eliakim. So these two kings, you can't separate. The one's taken and he's replaced. What's Eliakim's name changed to? Jehoiakim. And what does that mean? To rise up. Yeah. Okay. So, and How do those two fit? You can't separate God, Zechariah, and Josiah. Two other kings can't separate them. Uh, uh, well, no, no, they would be in a different place. Okay. But no, they wouldn't. What, what, what this is here, Jehoiahaz is representing a restraint. Okay, a restraint. Yeah. Okay. A restraint of a power. But anyway, that's what we're going to show. And once you, once you get to that level, you will have the 2520 upholding this reality that these last seven kings are the seven thunders, but you will find that when they're put together, that the seven kings and the seven thunders of the Millerite history, they contribute what their name means. And the names of the kings contribute to the understanding of Ezra 7-9, the tarrying time, the midnight cry, and the door closing. So the Lion of the tribe of Judah, he, he's putting little building blocks in place. And if you're unwilling to keep up with the advancing light of the third angel, one of the things that you'll start saying is you can't keep, you, as you're not refusing to keep up with it, but you want to still identify yourself as one of the messengers of this hour, one of, what, what's one of the things that you manifest at that time? And it's been manifested throughout this entire message. Well, pride perhaps, but what I'm getting at is you start saying, well, well these truths aren't testing truths. Not really uh, they're not salvation. They're not testing truths because I don't understand them. I'm not taking the time to understand them. And so when the other guys that are trying to understand them are saying they're testing truth, I know they're wrong. They can't be testing truth because if they are, the fact that I'm not studying means that I'm failing the test and I'm not willing to accept that accusation. But who is it? that is unsealing these truths. So if you're refusing to listen to his voice, is that a testing truth? Yeah, what isn't? And when you make that claim, when you make that claim, you're going back into this history before 9-11 because that's what the people said about this message from the very beginning. This isn't testing truth. So what are you doing? You're, you're regurgitating the 
arguments that have already been said. Of the Sanhedrin. Oh, so your, your did come, that's how your counterfeit comes first. That's what I see. It's a spiritualistic application because you return to the, you your actually didn't come first, but you're returning to what did come first. And that's how the counterfeit confused the church. Yeah, the, the, the arguments that they're going to use, they go back here and get them out of this yeah, history. Right. But they're being tested by all of the history of Adventism. Anyway, how often do you get to come? It's Sunday through Thursday. <laughs> you just going to come on Sundays? I don't know. I may be too. All right. So maybe what we need to do is assign one of us in this little classroom to take an evening in the, the week that's good for you and sit down and keep you abreast of this as it progresses. And then we're recording it so you can watch it. Pardon me? Uh, did you pray or did Brittany? I did pray. All right, Sister Brown, do you want to close with prayer?